Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Volume 1 Crusades prior to the rise of the Ayyubid state. Start of Part 1 of Chapter 3 The Beginning of the First Crusade After the speech of Urban II at Clermont in France, in which he called for a crusader war, he ordered his clergymen to go back to their countries and preach war and they made great efforts in doing so. The natural outcome of the propaganda campaign launched by the Pope and those whom he trusted was the launch of the First Crusade, which had two parts. One, the campaign of the masses, and two, the campaign of the princes. The First Crusade in both aspects attracted a great deal of unprecedented attention from contemporary historians whether they were Latin, Byzantine, or Muslim, as well as from modern historians who specialize in the study of the Crusades. The reason for that may be the serious consequences that resulted from that campaign in particular, as it led to the establishment of Crusader principalities in the East, some of which lasted as long as two centuries. The Crusader campaign was successful to a large extent in establishing four Latin principalities. 1. In the headwaters of the Euphrates at Edessa. 2. In northern Syria at Antioch. 3. On the Syrian coast at Tripoli. 4. In the heart of Palestine at Jerusalem. In addition, there were four major seigneuries. Sidon, Jaffa, Ascalon, and Galilee, and twelve smaller territories that were given to their owners by the Crusader kings in return for their loyalty and obedience. These were Arsuf, Hebron, Darim, Caesarea, Nablus, Bethsan, Haifa, Toron, that is Tibnin, Banyas, Hassankaf, Lod, and Beirut. It is worth mentioning that this success was due to a number of factors, including the following. 1. Lack of political unity in the Muslim world. 2. Contest for power within the Seljuk dynasty. 3. Presence of the Rafidi in Fatimid state. 4. The role of the Christians who were living in Greater Syria. 5 the attitude of some of the Arab Emirates towards the Crusader attack. 6. The role of the unorthodox Rafidi Batini Ismaili movement in putting obstacles in the path of the Jihad against the Crusaders. 7. The spread of the unorthodox Shiite doctrine and speculative theological ideas, Shiite Rafidi and Batini ideas. 8 the decline in economic prosperity prior to the Crusader attack. 9. Weakness of the Byzantine state. 10. Military experience of the Frankish knights. 11. Continual European reinforcements for the Crusader campaign. 12. Political tyranny and its effects on religion and life. And 13. Preoccupation of the Muslim scholars with arguing over minor issues of fiqh. Crusader strategy after occupation. The occupying Frankish forces, which were able and made plans to live in a strange environment, had no choice but to adopt a number of strategies that could be developed further in order to maintain their occupation for a long time. These strategies included the following. A. As much as possible, and by all available means, maintaining one of the most important means of their success, which was keeping the surrounding Islamic forces divided as much as possible, 
because that would cancel out the possibility of the Muslims confronting them with one united force. For that reason, they strove continuously from the outset to occupy regions of strategic importance, which served the purpose of isolating the Islamic regions and preventing the Muslim forces from uniting. This involved occupying Edessa, in Arabic Ar-Ruha, so as to prevent contact between Iraq and Syria. Later on, they took control of southern regions of Syria, such as Iraq, in present-day Jordan, and Ashobak, also in present-day Jordan, known to the Crusaders as Montreal or Mons Regalis, with the aim of preventing communication between Egypt and Syria. This approach made use of the geographical features of the land. On the human level, the Crusaders were eager to support ethnic and sectarian divisions in the surrounding Muslim areas, using a carrot and stick approach and a policy of forming alliances with some groups against others, which was aided to a large extent by the hostility that existed between Shiites and Sunnis. They were also aided by the presence of Christian minorities, some of whom the Crusaders were able to exploit by forming alliances with them and conspiring with them against the neighboring Muslims. B. The occupying Crusader forces concentrated on regions which guaranteed secure communication with their headquarters in Western Europe. Hence, they focused on occupying the Levantine coast in order to secure that, and they avoided seizing interior regions as much as possible for fear of losing this advantage, and so that they would not be besieged by Islamic forces, based on the assumption and fear that these forces might unite later on which would put them in jeopardy and lead to their defeat. c. The Crusader forces strove to form treaties with other forces that would be able to help them at various stages, either because of the latter's enmity towards the Muslims around them, or because of their desire to gain economic advantages. In this context, we may note these treaties began with Byzantium, then with some of the Italian city-states, and finally the possibility of forming alliances with the Mongol forces, which posed the greatest danger to the Islamic regions. d. From the outset, the Crusader forces in the Muslim East were eager to find a solution to the demographic problems that they faced in the East, in contrast to Muslim density. The Crusader forces dealt with this problem in different ways and by different means which were open to development, depending on the circumstances. For example, they followed a policy of killing or expelling Muslims in the regions that they occupied. Then they followed different methods at subsequent stages to preserve the Muslim population, if that served their interests. At the same time, they worked to attract migrants to the regions under Crusader dominance, either from Western Europe or Armenia or from Christian communities in the Islamic regions. They also resorted to militarizing Crusader society, so as to create a society of all groups and classes that would be able to offer military service to deal with the demographic shortfall. Nothing is more indicative of that than the fact that religious groups in Crusader society at all stages were the most well-trained and equipped in the military field, such as the Knights Templar and Hospitalia. e. The Crusader forces built military fortifications based on their own experience or by imitating the expertise that they found in the Muslim regions. Attention was paid to make these fortifications like early warning systems that were able to keep watch on Muslim movements. So great care was taken in selecting locations opposite important Muslim gathering places or in areas that could threaten Muslim interests, such as those that were built near trade routes. F. The Crusaders relied, as they learned from their experience of war with the Muslims, on using methods of rapid warfare. This did not require large numbers of troops and at the same time was aimed at specific targets within a carefully selected time frame, 
such as attacking agricultural areas at harvest time, which did not require a large military force, but at the same time was capable of inflicting a great deal of harm on the Muslims. G. The Crusaders also adopted a policy of making truces and offering some concessions to some Muslim groups so that they could focus on fighting other Muslim groups. This policy was successful during the period of Muslim division. It even led to them choosing to interfere in favor of one side against another, either as the result of a crusader offer of help or a request for help on the part of one or other Muslim side. H. The crusaders resorted to various means to keep the spirit of war strong in Western Europe so as to guarantee the continuation of crusader campaigns and to offer help and support to the crusader entities in the east. They paid a great deal of attention to keeping communication channels with Europe open, which guaranteed human reinforcements and continual material supplies. The kings of Europe felt a great responsibility towards the crusader kingdoms in the east, and they were committed to supporting and defending them. I. With the passage of time, the Crusaders adopted a strategy based on the idea that guaranteeing their presence in Greater Syria depended on seizing control of Egypt or eliminating it from the conflict by whatever means necessary. Thus we see that some later Crusader campaigns were directed primarily against Egypt. Researchers of the Crusades have found that they achieved some successes in this regard taking advantage of the hostility that sometimes arose between the rulers of Egypt and certain Syrian regions. J. Some crusader parties resorted to carrying out military attacks with the aim of striking at Muslim morale and threatening Muslim holy places, as happened in the case of expeditions in which some forces aimed to transgress against the holy places in the Hijaz. They also targeted some essential economic and religious facilities, as when they threatened trade routes and Hajj caravans. On some occasions, this role was played by the principalities of Kirak and Montreal, a Shobak, which belonged to the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Crusader Kingdoms, the papacy that supported them, and some of the clergy and thinkers worked to develop new strategies as a result of the failure of the military strategy, using methods other than military ones. This was based on the propagation of Christianity and the call for increased missionary activities among Muslims. We are not discussing the success or failure of this strategy. Rather, our concern is to point out that this was one of the alternatives that the Franks tried to use in order to achieve their goals. The Crusaders presented themselves as defenders of Christianity in the East, regardless of their sectarian differences, so they were portrayed as having come to save Byzantium from the Muslim Seljuk danger. They also depicted their march to the Islamic regions as having the aim of liberating the Eastern Christians from the Islamic yoke, guaranteeing as a result that they would help the Armenians and Syrians as they began to take control of Muslim regions. But this was a temporary strategy which began to diminish with the passage of time. Moreover, they formed alliances with divine Islamic sects, such as the Bathini movements. Along these strategies were followed, in general, by all the Crusaders, that did not prevent some commanders from following some temporary strategies that were specific to particular circumstances, which means that some of these principalities probably adopted policies that went against the general principles. From examining these strategies, it seems to us that the success of the Muslim forces in resisting the Crusader threat may be measured by the extent to which they adopted strategies and used means that put mitigated the danger posed by the crusader strategies, either by adopting opposing strategies, or by preventing the crusaders from implementing their strategies in actuality. This may be noted from the development of the Muslim reactions to the crusader challenge, 
starting at the time of Imad al-Din and Nur al-Din Zangi, up to the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, and finally the achievements of the Mamluk state. But it should not be understood from this that this development in the Muslim reaction during the time of the Zangids, Ayyubids, and Mamluks always took place within a positive framework. Rather, what happened sometimes was that the Muslim side or some of its forces or individuals contributed to the success of the Crusader strategies. Resistance movement during the Seljuk period. The shock of the fall of Jerusalem woke many Islamic scholars, judges, and rulers from their slumber, and they realized the seriousness of the invasion after it began to threaten their existence and position in the cities of those lands above and beyond the threat to Muslim lands and Islamic beliefs. Hence, the Islamic scholars and judges of Syria in Damascus, Aleppo, and Tripoli hastened to seek help from the central authorities in Baghdad and the local rulers. Knowing that they possessed the military strength that was capable of confronting this invasion. But the response of the Islamic scholars and judges of Syria to the Crusader invasion was not limited to seeking help and support. It went further than that and included many other means, such as writing treatises about jihad against the invasion, so as to prepare an intellectual framework and educate the Muslims in general as it attracted a great deal of attention from the Islamic scholars and scholars before and during the Crusader invasion. The need of the hour was for an intellectual mobilization that would spread Islamic teachings. This became essential at a time when Syria was involved in political, sectarian and military conflicts, conflicts which are reflected in the history books about the Islamic East. As a result, Many biographies of rulers, king and ruling families were written, as well as books about conflict with the Crusaders. Hence a number of Islamic scholars and judges hastened to enlighten Muslim societies, and from their works we can see that there were two groups. The first group focused on writing and preaching in a traditional manner, explaining issues and principles of Islam to the people. The second group focused on urging the people to fight and writing about the topic of jihad. They urged Muslims to get involved because they were aware of the general weakness of the Muslim faith and their negligence concerning matters of religion. Hence, many books were written before and during the Crusader invasion of the Levant. What concerns us here is the books of the Islamic scholars who urged an Islamic jihad and sought to mobilize Muslims and teach them about their religion so that they could resist that invasion. Among the most prominent of these Islamic scholars was the juristic scholar Ali ibn Tahir as sulami 431-500 Hijri, 1039-1106 Common Era. His full name was Ali ibn Tahir ibn Jafar al-Qaisi, as sulami at tamashqi as shafii He was a Syrian scholar who, as a result of that invasion, became a preacher and promoter of jihad, giving speeches and lessons in the mosques, traveling from one mosque to another throughout Syria and Palestine. His efforts are embodied in this book, Al-Jihad, which he wrote following the fall of Jerusalem in 492 Hijri, that is 1098 Common Era and in one of his speeches in which he urges the Muslims to wage jihad against this invasion. In the first chapters of his book, Al-Sulami focuses on number of important circumstances and issues which Syria and the Muslim world were facing at that time. He starts with a discussion of the general crusader policy which targeted Andalusia, Sicily and Syria. He was also the first to point out the unified goal of the Crusader Wars, encompassing their attacks on Andalusia, Sicily and Syria, an idea which was adopted and developed further by subsequent historians. Ibn al-Athir wrote, The Frankish state began to grow stronger and set out for the Muslim world, 
capturing some of it in 478 Hijri, when they seized Toledo and other cities in Andalusia. Then, in 484 Hijri, they targeted the island of Sicily and gained possession of it. In 490 Hijri, they set out for Syria. As-Sulami realized the weakness and division of the Muslim world, and that its disunity, not the strength of the Crusaders themselves, was the main factor for the success of the Crusaders in both the western and eastern wings of the Muslim world. He focused on the political divisions in Greater Syria in particular, because he lived there and was pained by what he saw of its people's reluctance to engage in jihad. as Sulami reminded the Muslims of the idea of continuing jihad at times of war and peace. As part of a general policy that the Muslim rulers and caliphs should adopt, as an essential condition of a successful confrontation. Every year, the Muslim ruler should lead an expedition outside the Muslim territory, not to satisfy greed or to seek booty, but to protect the Muslim land from the aggression of non-Muslims and to make them realize and fear Muslim strength on a continual basis. As an embodiment of the idea which in modern times as describing as taking the war to the enemy in his own land. As-Sulami reminded the Muslim rulers that this invasion was not only aimed at Muslim lands and faith, it was also aimed at removing them from power and expelling them from the land that was under their authority. His aim was to stir them up and urge them to engage in jihad, as they were following the example of the righteous Muslim predecessors in confronting this turmoil, and by this to expel the Crusaders. Anyone who reads as Sulami's book about jihad will immediately understand the depth of the pain and suffering felt by this Muslim scholar who saw the sanctity of Jerusalem being violated and transgressed. Hence the first thing he urged was rescuing Jerusalem from the hands of the invaders. Strive, may Allah have mercy on you in that jihad so that you might be victorious by means of Allah's support. as is regarded as the first to have realized the importance of a united jihad between Syria, Iraq and the cities of Asia Minor, before the Muslims united against the Crusaders under the leadership of the Zangids and Ayyubids. In this field he is regarded as one of the pioneers. as called upon Muslims to purify their souls and reform themselves, because this is the basis of Islamic unity and to resolve to persist in fighting this invasion. Give precedence to jihad over your own ego before jihad against your enemies, for your egos are more harmful to you than your enemies. Force your ego to refrain from what it is doing in disobedience towards its creator. Then you may gain what you are hoping for in terms of Allah's support against them. The Crusader invasion of Syria from as sulamis point of view did not come out of nowhere. He realized that the Muslims were weak because they were not adhering to the religion of Allah. Hence he strove to advise them to turn back to Allah and purify their souls, to come back to the book of Allah, that is the Quran, to give up the sins that they had been committing and to take steps towards jihad. Let your aim in jihad be to please your Lord and to defend yourselves and your brothers, so that Allah may grant you reward for your jihad. But that cannot be achieved while we watch the progress of the Crusader invasion, in which they have captured many cities, unless we hasten to confront them and protect the cities that have not fallen into their hands. Mobilizing and heading towards the cities that they have captured from us is nothing less than a war in which we are defending ourselves, our children, our wives and our wealth, and guarding the land that is still in our hands. as sulamis call to the Muslims was a general call to unite the Muslim forces, Syrian, Mesopotamian and Egyptian. He advised them to follow a methodology of purifying their souls, forgiving one another and embarking on jihad, so that they could achieve their goal of defeating the invaders, as he thought that if the Muslim rulers could not forget their grudges and differences, 
then they were still following a path of Jadiliyat and were not following the wise saying which stemmed from their Islamic heritage. At times of hardships, grudges disappear. In many places in his book Al-Jihad, As-Sulami urged, incited, exhorted and warned, and he addressed the rulers in particular regarding the necessity of jihad in the speeches and lessons that he delivered in the Umayyad mosque in Damascus and in the cities of Syria and Palestine. He did not omit any minute detail that had to do with jihad, but he discussed it. We may note that in his book As-Sulami discussed and highlighted the divisions and splits in the Muslim East, especially in Syria, which had weakened and fragmented the Muslim forces and had weakened the belief in the obligatory nature of jihad, which is something that the invaders took advantage of. He dealt with this problem by discussing the importance of purifying the soul, returning to adherence to the religion of Allah, setting things straight with one another and embarking on jihad to confront the invasion. He pointed out that this could not be achieved unless the Muslim forces were united. Hence his book Al-Jihad spoke in terms. It was not addressed only to specific political leaders or certain groups in Syria, for example. Rather, it was in accordance with a clear Islamic vision that was based on strong and authentic references in the Quran and the Sunnah and in books of biography and military campaigns of early Islam, connecting its subject matter with the crusader threat to Syria. The way in which he compiled information and quoted it in the right context is indicative of the extent of his far-sightedness and deep insight. Our research has shown that the first call to jihad was not issued by the rulers. Instead, it came from the Muslim scholars of Islamic jurisprudence and the ulama, from teachers, scholars, jurists, and writers. As-Sulami is regarded as one of the first to urge a jihad. He was part of the current of popular Islamic resistance, which was supported by Islamic scholars and judges. As-Sulami wrote his book at an early stage in this war, which is indicative of his intelligence and acumen in understanding the complex problems faced by Syria. Even though general circumstances were not conducive to the success of his call to jihad, at that early stage in particular, his book was a contribution to paving the way for the Zangid and the Ayyubid phases. Professor Ramadan Hussain Ashawish undertook a study and commentary on As-Sulami's book Al-Jihad, which he presented as a master's thesis at Al-Fatih University in Tripoli, Libya, in 1992 Common Era. Islamic scholars and judges participate in physical jihad. One of the most prominent examples of an Islamic scholar's participation in the regular army and on the battlefield, so as to demonstrate the ideal state of belief in jihad and defending one's land and oneself, was that of Abu Muhammad Abdullah ibn Mansur. He was known as Ibn Sulayha, the judge, Qazi, of the fortress of Jablah, who became the ruler of that fortress after the death of his father Mansur in 495 Hijri, that is 1100 Common Era. He had great military experience because he loved the soldierly life and had chosen his troops and proven his good character. The talents of this ruler judge were manifested when the Franks besieged the fortress of Jabla in an attempt to capture it in 494 Hijri, that is 1100 Common Era. Initially, he used what is now known as psychological warfare when he came up with a brilliant plan to spread fear in the ranks of the Frankish forces. He pretended that the Sultan Barkiyaruk was headed towards Syria, coming to his aid which made the Franks worry and fear spread throughout their ranks and caused them to withdraw. When the Franks realized that this was really a trick, they came back and besieged the city again, but the judge repeated his trick in a different manner, spreading a rumor among the crusader ranks that this time the Egyptians were coming to fight them and help them, so they ended their siege of the fortress. It seems that the Franks did not have sufficient information about the state of the fortress 
or of the number of troops that the Qazi had. Otherwise, they would not have abandoned the siege on these two occasions. The Franks quickly realized that this was a case of psychological warfare and what the aim of it was, and they returned and besieged the fortress for the third time in Shaban of 494 Hijri. But the Qazi realized that the Franks had figured out his old tactics, so he resorted to a new way of resisting the Franks. He worked out a deal with the Christians who were in the fortress, agreeing that they would send a Christian delegation to the Franks to work out terms of surrendering the fortress to them, in which the Franks would send some of their knights to take over the fortress. They were to send 300 of their most prominent and bravest knights. The Franks agreed to that, but it appears that Ibn Suleha had set a trap for them. The Frankish warriors kept climbing up the rope, one by one, and every time one of them reached Ibn Suleha, who was on top of the wall, he killed him, until he had killed them all. The next morning, the Muslims threw the heads of the Franks down the crusaders below. The crusaders were very upset about the trap that had been set for them by the Qadi of Jablah, and the success that the Qadi had achieved so they decided to take the fortress by any means. They built a wooden tower and used it to destroy one of the towers of the fortress. But with his quick wits and cleverness, the Qazi could see that the danger was imminent, so he did not slow down or surrender, but he hastened to put in motion yet another brilliant plan, similar to those that had already caused losses to the enemy more than once. He made holes in the walls of the city, and it seems that these holes were in the rear wall. This was so that the army would be able to exit through these holes. Al-Qazi ibn Suleyha and his army came out to fight the Franks and then pretended to flee from them, thus tricking the invaders. The Franks did not realize what was happening, so they hastened to pursue the Muslims as far as the gates of the city, at which point the Muslim army took the opportunity to come out through those holes and come at the crusaders from the rear. They attacked the Franks from behind and defeated them. Al-Qadi ibn Suleyha must have had some knowledge of the arts of war and Islamic military methods. The art of psychological warfare was nothing new in the Islamic military heritage at the time of the crusades. Because such methods had been used by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle of the trench in five Hijri when he dug the ditch and defeated the confederates, and in the battle of Murta in 8 Hijri, when the commander, Khalid ibn al-Walid turned the battle around from defeat to victory against the Byzantines by using psychological warfare, stirring up the dust with the horse's feet to make the Byzantines think that reinforcements had come to the Muslims, so that they fled in defeat and the Muslim army was able to withdraw from the battlefield without incurring any other losses. Psychological warfare was also used in many other battles, including the Battle of Yarmouk in 13 Hijri, when Khalid ibn Walid anhu, divided his troops, putting the right flank on the left and the rear guard in the front, a military tactic which faced the huge Byzantine army completely and led to their defeat. Scholars and judges urge fighting on the battlefield. One of the most prominent of such figures was Al-Qadi Abu al-Fadl ibn al-Kashab, the Qadi of Aleppo, whose exploits in this field were famous. When the Crusader siege of Aleppo intensified in 513 Hijri, that is 1119 Common Era, Al-Qadi ibn al-Kashab came and urged the people to fight, riding on his mount with his spear in his hand, delivering an eloquent speech which motivated and stirred them. The people wept and felt great respect for him, and they sallied forth to fight the invaders. Although the people of Aleppo were able to save their city that year, the crusaders did not hesitate to try again to take Aleppo. In 518 Hijri, that is 1124 Common Era, when they destroyed all the villages around Aleppo, 
so that they would not be able to offer any support to the city. The Franks camped in Haran and then marched towards Aleppo from the direction of Mashhad al Jaf from the north. Al Qadi ibn al Kashab played a role in encouraging the people to fight the invaders and in encouraging Aksunkur al Barsuki, the ruler of Mosul, to join the fight, as will be discussed further, inshallah, when discussing the role of Seljuk rulers in Mosul, Damascus, and elsewhere in warding off the attacks of the Crusaders. Poets and their role in the resistance movement Some poets played a major role in encouraging the Muslims and describing the situation of the Ummah and the nature of the Crusader invasion which had occupied their land and transgressed people's honor. One of the most famous of these poems was that of Al-Qadi al-Harawi, which was also attributed to Abu al-Muzaffar al-Aburdi, which begins with the words, we mixed blood with our flowing tears and there was no room left to apportion blame. The worst weapon for a man is flowing tears when the flames of war intensify by the sword. At the beginning of this ode, he clearly states that the people were weeping so intensely that blood flowed from their eyes because their weeping was so intense and ongoing and that they had wept until there was no energy left to blame anyone. But he soon realized that weeping, no matter how intense, not avail anything in battle, and nothing could intensify the fire of battle except the sword. O people of Islam, there lie ahead of you events which will bring low those who are high. Are you sleeping with a sense of security and joy, living a life of softness and ease? How can your eyes have their fill of sleep? when there are events which are awakening every sleeper, when your brothers in Syria cannot even nap, except on the backs of horses or in the bellies of vultures. The Byzantines are humiliating them whilst you live a life of luxury, like a man averse to combat. Here the poet is addressing those who have stayed away from fighting alongside their Muslim brothers in Syria. He begins this portion of his poem with a heated call to the Muslims. O sons of Islam, wake up from your sleep, for this invasion is coming to you and it will bring low your elite. Then he wonders about them and their sleep. How can they sleep peacefully, enjoy a life of luxury and feel safe, when not far away terrible things are befalling their brothers in Syria? and they cannot find even a few minutes in which to take a nap in their houses. Most of the time they are on horseback, fighting, or the decree of martyrdom has overtaken them, and they are snatched by the vultures, as they have no one to bury their bodies, or they may fall into the hands of their Frankish enemies and be humiliated. But it seems that you are enjoying a life of ease, and are either surrendering or allying yourself with your enemy. How much blood was shed and how many young Muslim girls were killed whilst trying to cover their beauty with their hands out of shyness. Silver swords turned red and spearheads stripped with blood in the midst of stabbing and striking, which made the heads of young boys turn grey. These are such battles that those who keep away to remain safe and sound will regret it bitterly. The hands of the polytheists have unsheathed the swords, but they will be sheathed again in their own chests and skulls. And you can almost hear him who is buried in Taiba, calling out in the loudest voice, O family of Hisham. In these lines, the poet depicts the ferocity of the battles which took place between the Muslims and their Frankish enemies, in which the blood of many Muslims was spilled and women's seclusion was transgressed upon, but they could not find anything with which to protect their chaste bodies except their arms, which they held up out of shyness and fear. These battles grew intense, with a great deal of killing, until the edges of the swords and spears appeared to glow red hot and children's hair would turn grey because of the horrific scenes of stabbing and striking that they saw. Then he again alerts those who stay behind, 
and warns them that they will regret not participating in these battles, warning again of their dangers and mocking the enemy by saying that the sharp swords that they have unsheathed will come back to them buried in their own chests and skulls. In the final lines, he reaffirms how terrifying these wars are by saying that the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from his tomb in Medina, is summoning the Arabs and Muslims, not only the clan of Hisham, to help in the fight against the enemy. End of part one of chapter three.